This is Writers on Film, the only podcast dedicated to books on cinema. Hello everyone and welcome to Writers on Film. My name's John Bleasdale. I'm a writer and film critic. There are a couple of things to be said before uh, today's podcast. One is uh, we've got Paul Cronin, who is the author of Werner Herzog on Werner Herzog, The Guide for the Perplexed. He's also uh, written books on Kirstami and uh, Alexander McKendrick. Um, among many, many, many others. We had so much to talk about that we did talk for quite a long time, as you can hear during the episode. It's about an hour and a half. So uh, instead of cutting up the episode, I've just left it as one long conversation so you can hear it organically as well. The other thing to mention is the sound quality, uh, specifically on my end, is, isn't is great. And I so what I've tried to do is switch between uh, two different sound sources. But occasionally when we're talking over each other, you'll hear... Uh, the recording from Paul's end and so my voice might come across as a little bit tinny but I've tried to make it as smooth and hopefully it won't distract you though now that I've said it you'll probably be listening out for it so I'm sorry about that as well in fact I tell you what the conversation is so long I'm not even going to bother asking you to like subscribe or anything like that I'd rather you just enjoy the conversation talk about Werner on a fairly regular basis right I don't I don't make a sort of philosophical point of saying no but I say no I turn down a lot of things just because kind of like to keep a low profile but I felt after 20 years it was sort of time to maybe put a few things on the record just about my so-called career I suppose I mean 20 years of of this bookmaking and and well, film and filmmaking actually too. But. Yeah. Well, where when did it start? Well, I mean, twenty years ago it started. But where? What was? How did you start getting into this book writing business? I fear it's uh, the old story of not wanting to do what I was doing, which was basically I was at law school, and really not that was really not the right path for me. It was very obvious that that was a big mistake. Now I think I think I write about this. The truth is I haven't. I didn't do any rereading uh, in advance of our chat, but I think I write about this in the Herzog book. And this is also my opportunity to pay homage to someone uh, whose name may have come up in other conversations, certainly would come up in the conversations of anyone interested in film books who came of age, as I think we probably did, late 80s, something like that. And that fellow yeah. was Walter Donahue at Faber and Faber. I actually had a chat with Walter the other day um, just to fill in some gaps because he's an extraordinary fellow. And basically, I wouldn't be sat here talking to you if it weren't for Walter. I basically was having a miserable time at law school and um, had seen Walter's name alongside that of John Borman mm. on those projection mm. books. And it seemed that every Faber film book had acknowledged Walter as some kind of authority figure. So I I vividly remember, I, I basically one Wednesday morning decided that I wasn't going to go to any more classes. <laughs> and um, I just wrote a letter to Walter Donahue. And it basically I... said, you don't know me, Mr. Donahue, but I've never been more certain of anything in my life, which is that I have something to offer you. I have all your books your being Faber and Faber's film books on my shelves here. And I feel that I should like to uh, be given some kind of opportunity. It was very cheeky, mm. but felt like the right thing to do. Anyway, I was, so that was a Wednesday. I was sat at home on a Friday evening. I've s since learned that Walter would often stay late at the office. My memory was it was, I don't know, 7, 8, 9 p.m. The phone rings mm. and it's Walter Donahue. And he says, well, look, I got your letter. He's a very low-key guy. He's American, American-born. Um, right. So I was, oh, it's an American guy running Faber Film Books out of London. Okay, fair enough. And he says, um, my assistant, who happened to be Richard Kelly, who did those wonderful books on dogma and 
Alan Clark. Uh, you yeah. I'm sure know that, that material. And has since become a, a novelist. Richard, uh, Walter said, Richard's going away to the Cannes Film Festival. So it was exa- more or less exactly 21 years ago now. Right. And he said, uh, come in on Monday morning. I can't pay you, but uh, you'll see how the operation works. And, you know, we'll just chat. And Monday morning, <laughs> I was... <laughs> I was basically sitting in the office of Walter Donahue, Faber Film Books, thinking, wow, this is exactly where I need to be. Not just want to be, need to be. Yeah. I mean, I was not that young by that point. I was in my late 20s, and I just hadn't really found... I mean, I had a sense as to what I wanted to do. I'd never interviewed anyone before, never written anything to speak of. Right, you'd not been a, like, you tried your hand as a critic or anything like that? Oh, like no, that. nothing. I'm, I'm, I've never been paid to give my opinion on anything, and I n- will never be. No, I'm not a critic. Right. I mean, if you want to frame what I do these days, I feel I'm a historian. Right. So that was good. That was good, being there for a few weeks, uh, working with Walter. He, Walter, by the way, doesn't just do Faber film books. He edits, as, as I understand it, he has edited Paul Auster's work for decades. Right. Right. He doesn't just do film books. And he told me the other day that he, when he first met Wes Anderson, he walked into Wes's apartment, maybe in New York, and there was a whole shelf of the black Faber film scripts. Those that those books had a profound impact, I think, maybe on our on our on a small section of our generation. No, absolutely. I totally I totally agree. I mean, I remember I was. Uh, doing a, my degree at Liverpool University, and there was a little shop called the, uh, the Blue Coat. The Blue Coat Art Centre is still still there, but they would do kind of remaindered books, I guess they would be. And that I would always go down there because there was every now and again you would get a Faber and Faber film book, and that would be the sort of like the gold in the mine, you know, stacks of the beautiful black, you know, with the little sort of clapperboard on the front, and then the, the and then the interview books. I actually I was at I was at Manchester University, and I remember in it must have been ninety one maybe Tarantino came through town to play Reservoir right. Dogs at it's terribly embarrassing to not remember the name of that really great repertory th- cinema. The Corner House was it. Corner House, which has since gone, I think. Went to the Corner House every multiple times a week, and Tarantino showed up. And I, I mentioned Tarantino because it was the script of Pulp Fiction, which I think pushed the Faber film list into a kind of different league. It sold many, many, many tens of thousands of copies, as Walter reminded me. He also, just to historicize it, it's interesting, those of those of, those of you who know the history of Faber, Walter was brought in actually to work on the film list, and there was a certain amount of, I'm not going to say cash around, but they had Faber had more than they had previously expected because of cats. Do you know about this? Um, no. Because T. S. Eliot worked at Faber. Of I don't know. Yeah. The, I yeah. don't know the details, but basically Faber got a cut of the Cats musical, which opened, I think, in 1981, wow. and that that was a bit of a cash injection for them and I, I, re- I really don't want to put this on I mean Walter just Walter and I chatted about this someone I mean I'm sort of looking into this and maybe thinking of writing something about it or at least doing something with Walter about it but anyway there was money to create this film list and that's what Walter did I mean they're interesting connections for me I made three films and ed- co-edited a massive essentially book about Peter Whitehead, the British film director. And in the late 60s, mid-60s, Peter um, approached Jean-Luc Godard because Peter was obsessed with Alphaville and he wanted to publish the script of Alphaville. And Peter Whitehead's at the forefront of the publishing of film scripts in the mid-60s. So he publishes Alphaville under his imprint, Lorimer. You still see in those old Charing Cross bookshops that we probably, you know, know, I used to inhabit all day. You used to see these books, the old Lorimer books, Peter Lorimer. Lorimer Whitehead, it's actually his middle name. So the Lorimer books, Peter published three or four, I think a, a couple more Godard, maybe a Bergman. And then Andrew Sinclair took over Lorimer imprint and did about 40 of these books, which were then bought out, I think, by Simon and Schuster. Anyway, the point is that Walter bought out the back catalogue of, or essentially bought out the rights to all the Lorimer books. And also... Um, the Laval Saint du Cinema collection, you know this, the French, the French, it's in the format of a magazine. There's a Laval Saint du Théâtre as well. Basically, they publish individual film scripts and theatre scripts. Extraordinary collection, going back to the, I mean, I'm going to say late 50s. 
Um, it's still being published today. So Walter, I think, bought the rights to those and cherry picked the best ones. But anyway, I just wanted to sort of pay homage to Walter Donahue here, not just for a per for personal reasons, just because without Walter, we really wouldn't have those that extraordinary run of film books from you know the mid eighties through to maybe I feel I got in just under the wire, John, because that was um. two thousand when I was sitting in that office, and the film list I think. But through no fault of anyone, has fallen away a little bit. I mean, there's any number of reasons for this. Um, sure. I mean, <laughs> you know, one sort of longs to do another interview book with a film director, but, you know, who's left, you know? Right, yeah. I mean, we've been... This This has sort of somewhat been like a, a theme of uh, of the podcast as, as sort of seeing this, this amazingly fruitful moment in film book history. And nowadays... It's still going. People are still writing brilliant film books, but they're kind of having to broaden their their perspective and take it in more as a piece of history, social and political, and what's happening at the time that a film is being made and all those things, which is fascinating, which is great. Before we go on to that, though, I wanted to ask your opinion about this, because um, I used to read scripts all the time, and I still will occasionally read a script. What What is the, what for you, what is the fascination with reading a script? I mean, is this something you would still do, even in the age where the film is so available? Well, I think this is very interesting, because this is one reason why the Faber film list, to go back to that again, really dropped away, because people could buy DVDs, and they could listen to audio commentaries. And they could do any number of other things other than read the script. I mean, for all my talk of Faber film scripts, <laughs> I, d I don't remember being... Look, the, the, the part of my interest in that as a younger person was... a. I, I still have a book fetish, basically, and uh, I, I enjoyed buying those. And, 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 yeah, I'm sure I read some of them. I mean, for example, I do vividly remember reading the... Three Colors Trilogy script, the Kijlowski film. And I was draw moved to tears by the end of it just by reading the script. I thought that's a, an impressive achievement. But much more interesting, John, is generally what I, what I read now in that context, which is early draft scripts of things like... Uh, and and, and, and um, for example, I'm sat here at the moment working on... We may, we may later talk about McKendrick... Um, I've spent a lot of time working on Alexander McKendrick. I'm sat here at the moment reading a, a script of a film that he wanted to make but never achieved uh, production on in the mid-60s. And that's fascinating to see why or how this thing may have played out on the screen, why McKendrick didn't like it. I've got his notes about why he was he found the script to be lacking. So I don't know. I'm not I don't read a lot of scripts these days. To be honest, I don't read a lot of film books these days. <laughs> I just, just, I mean, perfect, perfect guest well, for the podcast. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I confess that um, I don't read any. I, I read very few academic film books. That's for sure. Right, right. Um, I mean, I have a PhD, but I really find I'm almost embarrassed to to uh, to tell people that. I'm not. I don't feel I'm. A, I'm an academic. I th I'd like to think that um, the the work that I've done in terms of film books is more craft based. It's not criticism. It's not maybe history. It's craft. I think the Herzog book, the interview book I did with Werner Herzog, the book I, the book I did, sort of it's kind of in conjunction with Abbas Kiristami, and certainly the McKendrick book which I edited after his death, I feel are all very much pointed towards craft. I feel that's the most useful useful thing I can offer the world at this point. Werner was never about to sit and write that book, nor was Kirstami. And of course, McKendrick was dead. So I feel, I feel that was a useful, <laughs> a constructive use of my time. I still do. I still do. Oh, well, I mean, I read the Herzog book last week, I think and had been pointed towards it. I've got a Herzog story as well, because I met him when I was in Cannes, met him at a party on the beach in Cannes, and uh, he was with his wife, and and they were, they, he received some award, and that's, that was why he was there. 
and I very timidly approach the table because I'm not very I'm not I'm not very good at networking or doing any of that sort of stuff. And I just said, I'm I'm really sorry to disturb you, Mr. Herzog, but I'm a huge fan of your work, and I just wanted to express my appreciation. And he uh, he sort of excused himself from the table, stood up, and took me to one side and just said, um, Well, what what are you doing here? What, what what's your role and I said well I'm I'm a critic so I'm writing uh, uh, reviews and stuff and interviews and stuff but I'm also uh, got a screenplay and I'm sort of going around trying to generate some interest and he said well then you're not a fan you are a colleague uh, one of the reasons I wanted maybe I think I think one of the reasons I wanted to chat with you after having really turned down so many opportunities to do so with other people over the years is that no matter what anyone ever says about Werner Herzog writes about him tweets about him he is the loveliest, sweetest, fluffiest guy I've ever met. I just saw him in Los Angeles last week. And and yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned his wife, Lena, because for those of those in the know, it, it, it's a twofer. You get, you get Lena with Werner, which is fantastic. She is extraordinary. Right. And just sitting with the two of them having lunch, I saw Werner's new, I went to see his new film. He showed me a new film his new film, a new documentary he's made or is making. I just, I have great love and affection for, for those people. Just, I just, yeah. I just wanted to say that. Um, he's been nothing but, I mean, I wrote to him after three weeks of sitting in Walter's, Walter Donahue's office in central London. Really, I don't really recall what I was doing. Not much, I think, just sort of shuffling papers around. And Walter would, he's a kind of mad scientist. He would sh pop in, trying to find his glasses but they were on it you know they were on his forehead he, he hadn't noticed kind of, kind of thing he's that kind of guy i basically said why has no one ever done a Werner herzog interview book and my memory of my memory of this is walter saying why well, people have written to us but i didn't like their approach i remember thinking approach you just sit and talk to the guy don't you i mean what what, what kind of approach would there be so he basically said well write up a proposal and i'll take it to the board which i did and it was apparently approved at which point, then, I had to get Werner on board. And I, at that point, he still had an office in Munich. And I think I must have got the fax number from the website. Anyway, I faxed him. Basically, rather formal, rather uptight kind of English approach. Dear Mr. Herzog, I think it would be an excellent idea if blah, 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 blah. Fax comes back. Basically, there will be no Herzog on Herzog it's from Werner. <laughs> and I, I was really shaken. I clearly invested a lot emotionally in this idea. And I, I, that evening, I just kind of dashed off another fax, which was, I'd like to think, more laid back, more open. I don't know if it was more honest, but it was more something. Mm. It was longer, it was two pages, and it, in, broad, in the broadest terms, explained why, not necessarily why I was the right person to do this, although presumably I didn't, mention that but why this in and of itself was a good idea i.e this interview book yeah. and he faxed back basically said this changes things let me look let me see i'm going to be in london he was to be in london at some point shortly thereafter to work on a film called invincible which is a very interesting film a sort of holocaust world war ii film and and in just last week we i don't know how it came up in conversation but th this this, in, this initial interaction between us came up and he basically said, yes, something like, I think he was just being nice. But he said, yes, I felt the intensity of your, uh, intensity of your request or something like that. But, you know, 21 years later, it's all water under the bridge, etc. You know, the book's done and there will not be another edition of that book. But I'm, I think it's a, look, I, Vern is an extraordinary guy. He's full of great stories and uh, it's nice to have them all in one place, basically between the covers of that book. And it, I mean, it's one of the funniest film books I've ever read as well. Really? Just, just, I, I think he's the king of Bayfoss. He just has this way of building up this huge thing and then he, he just undercuts it with a line. Like um, he was talking about the bad lieutenant, bad lieutenant in uh, them shooting it and a hurricane coming in and, you know, we're going to go out and we're going to film Nick Cage's and then they decide, um, let's not bother. And he says, he has this phrase and then Hurricane Gust. I'm going to, I keep doing an impersonation of his voice, which I shouldn't, but Hurricane Gustav hit the town a week later with all the strength of a spinster's fire. That's right. Just, I remember that line. Yeah, that's a good one. That's just a, 
you couldn't I mean, you couldn't invent them. If, you know, if you were inventing a fictional director, you wouldn't be able to come up with that stuff. I get an email a week, John, from someone either telling me that that book is something of a, as an important text for them. And then the last line is also, by the way, can you put me in touch with her? <laughs> can you put me in touch with her? That's her. I mean, I don't know. The book seems to have taken on some kind of, I'd like to think, you know, it goes, be, I think it goes beyond film. I mean, as I mentioned to you, um, there's a there's a kind of rather um, tentative m methodology behind the three books that I've the three big film books that I've done. Big, I consider them to be. Sure. They were they were they were big for me. The Herzog, the Curious Dami, and the McKendrick. The McKendrick, the the Herzog book really is all about perseverance. I don't know if one is going to learn a great deal about filmmaking from that book. I'd, I hope so, but it seems to me that it's more about. Good God, look what this guy did, dragging a ship across a mountain, etc., etc. I better get up in the morning and get to work. The Curious Dami is, so that's perseverance. The Curious Dami is poetry. Mm. Some, some kind of very subjective way of looking at the world and an ability to represent that, interestingly, to audiences. And so precision poetry and McKendrick is somehow, sorry, perseverance is, Mc, is Herzog. Poetry is Curious Dami and McKendrick is somehow a precision because there is a great um, structural approach to his way of certainly teaching narrative cinema. And um, so the three Ps, it seems to me without, you need all three of them. Without precision, everything's a bit of a formless mess. Without perseverance, nothing gets done. And without poetry, it's all kind of by the numbers. Mm -hmm. So without really trying, I'd like to, I like, I like the, the, the kind of tripartite approach to the whole thing, you know. So like I say, it's about craft. I do a lot of teaching of of, of um, 18 year old film students who are just starting at film school. And I've, been, I've just heard, I've, I've just listening to them and working with them over the years, I'm increasingly convinced that this kind of 3P approach, or at least an understanding of the three, is important. Mm. I would never push it on anyone. I, I'm just, it's my personal opinion. Um, it's how, the, the, working with those three, two very closely for years, and McKendrick long after he was gone. Although, that material still has so much life to it. In fact, ironically enough, at the moment, it has more life than, well, Abbas is gone, but has the, mm. my work on McKendrick has, is a very live project. I'm working on eight McKendrick books. Yeah, I saw. I mean, that's, that's amazing that there's that much material. I just found some more in L.A. His, I met his son in a storage unit, and uh, he pulled right. out another box of material. It just wow. keeps on coming. In fact, I'll, there's a whole Italian connection because McKenrick was in Italy for the final year of the war running a documentary camera crew. Right. And I'm convinced that there's some a, a fair amount of more research to be done. So I'll be in touch about that, Joe. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for anything I could do to help. Absolutely. I mean, the other thing that the three books and the three filmmakers sort of seem to combine is that they're very, they're very unconventional teachers you know and and you know Werner has his rogue film school Abbas has his has his London-based sort of workshops that he's doing and McKendrick sort of gives up uh, making movies in order to to sort of devote himself to teaching was that part of your sort of path or was that just complete coincidence I mean absolutely right. they all I mean I'm not sure about unconventional but they definitely were all into teaching as you say, Werner has for a time, he's done, I think, maybe half a dozen of his three-day rogue film schools. I met Abbas when, and it turns out he'd been doing it for years in Iran, but he was, I think this is around 2005, he was in London for a big retrospective and the, at, the, at the French Institute, he agreed to do a 10-day workshop. And I just applied as a regular punter. I mean, I just sort of sat, oh, this, I, this, this, is, this will be interesting. I applied and I got in with maybe two dozen others. And we sat in a room um, on day one um, in South Kensington, and I just thought, and he started talking, and he was talking through an interpreter, although it turns out he never really needed an interpreter. He, his his right. English was very good. It was pretty good. Um, and he got to talking, and I just thought, wow, this is really interesting. And I just started writing it all down. And I, I kind of backed away from, because I was there ostensibly to make films as a student, but mm. um, I kind of backed away from that. And I think Abbas acknowledged that pretty quickly and was happy about it. I remember at one point, a couple of days in, there was a basement to the place where they had set up. This is where this is a, at a time 
way back in 2005 when most people presumably didn't have their own editing software on their computers. So they'd set up a bank of computers where we could edit our films, which we were meant to make that week. And so he was down there. And at one point I, I pulled him aside and I gave him a copy of Herzog on Herzog, which was the first edition of the Herzog book. Mm. And I remember he looked at it. He, looked, he stared at it and he looked at me and he looked back at the book and he looked at me and he said, you did this? I said, yeah. He said, we love this guy. We love him. And I said, yeah, I, yeah that's, I did that book. And from that point on, it was, I, I ended up spending 10 years with just going to workshops with him, just drinking wine with him in <laughs> Italian restaurants and driving around Italian countryside. He loved Italy, as you know. Yeah, um, yeah. So that was good. So teaching, yeah. And then McKendrick, of course, that's a whole, I've written a whole book. I am writing a whole book about his teaching career, which is just right. extraordinary extraordinary stories there's another book i'm essentially working on i mean another book that i feel i mean because i just get emails from people all the time saying on filmmaking which is a collection of mckendrick's notes so basically mckendrick was the british filmmaker ealing studios 1950s sweet smell of success in hollywood 1957 makes three more films at a moment when he just had enough he retires well steps back from filmmaking and becomes a teacher and spends the last nearly 25 years of his life teaching in Los Angeles, just north of Los Angeles in a film school. Very interesting school as well. That's a whole part of the story. So on filmmaking, I edited a collection of his notes to students into a book called On Filmmaking. There's a sequel to that book, which I'm working on, which is twice as long and 10 times wow. as interesting. I mean, the te there's so much more material. Book of interviews, uh, book of scripts. The book I'm writing about is career. I, oh, I was going through his son's house years ago. <laughs> I mean, it's insane. I'm going through an old linen closet, and, Matt, and his son says, oh, there might be something in there for you. I pull out of this linen closet the script, the very script that McKendrick held in his hands when he did, was directing Sweet Smell of Success, full of handwritten annotations. No. Unbelievable. So we get that scanned. We're going to do something with that. He wrote an extended essay about his time in Italy during the last year of the war, which was really quite extraordinary for him, as well as recording, documenting the return to normality after the Nazis, after the liberation of Rome, essentially. I mean, that includes you know, filming joyousness and football matches and this kind of thing, but also executions and trials where the defendant was dragged from the courthouse and lynched. I mean, just very dark and disturbing things kind of culminating in his filming of the exhumation of 330 uh, civilians who'd been executed in a disused abandoned mine in the south of Rome. This is a well documented, oh, this yeah, the, the Adiati uh, Fossi Adiatini massacre. Yeah, As I recall, yeah. I think 30, 33 SS soldiers were killed by the resist a, a resistance bomb this is shortly before the liberation of Rome, which, as I recall, is the first major European capital to be liberated. I think the day after D-Day. Anyway, so they arrive in Rome and they, they're, they're sent down to film the exhumation of this, of this uh, site. I mean, it's, of course, years later, McKendrick writes this extraordinary essay called The Death of Comedy, in, in which he writes about his experience and how filming the exhumation of these bodies who'd been down there by that point for weeks taught him everything he needed to know about comedy because he talks about how at one point one of the soldiers he was working with just it's all very unpleasant but grabbed one of these corpses and the head rolled off and everyone just burst into they couldn't stop laughing he said everyone just was almost in tears so this basic notion of that which is um, extraordinary funny, or extraordinarily funny, looked at from any other point of view, is extraordinarily unpleasant and grim. I mean, that's a sort of very loosely put, very badly put um, tenet of his comedy. But anyway, so there's lots of McKendrick stuff to come. That was the that was the massacre. Just to just to be clear, I think if I remember rightly, so so the the SS were thirty guys were killed in a bomb and then they chose a list of 300 sort of random Roman one, Roman. Uh, ten, 10 for one so i think yeah. 330 yeah. ss and they decided as a uh, to make an example as i recall one can read I f i'm fairly certain i wouldn't swear by this but fellini and visconti were in the neighborhood and were nearly picked up and wow. sent to the fosse Adiantini. 
It was ra- it was somewhat random. I don't think they emptied the prisons. I have to check. There's a vast yeah. literature on this, which I've yet to get to. But McKendrick wrote an extended essay about his time there. I also found in the National Archives in London and D.C. Uh, weekly cables that he wrote uh, explaining what he'd been doing. So I'm working on a rather massively annotated edition of this essay. I mean, Ian McKendrick's a unique figure. I don't... And please let me know, folks, you know, if there's anyone of his stature of a narrative filmmaker who had an equally important career as a as a film teacher and i don't mean just popping onto campus you know for a year um, and teaching a class and then going off to make more films i mean he absolutely quit cold turkey basically Mm. in 1969 and spent 20 25 years working on this career of articulating that which had been previously a wholly intuitive process for him which and here's an extraordinary filmmaker you know, I mean, really a brilliant filmmaker, I think. Um, but he turns out to be just as, uh, just as good, if not better, a um, a teacher. I mean, he understood how to, as I say, turn these kind of intuitive processes that he'd been working with. He never went to film school. He never went to any college of any for any length of time. Completely self-taught. I think that's what I meant by unconventional, in the sense that all of these are not people who have, uh, are going through formal, some sort of formal apprenticeship themselves. You know, Herzog just starts making films. I don't know much about, uh, I, don't, I know less about uh, Keir Starmer's career, but I get the feeling that when they're going, like, for instance, in, in, the, in the book about Abbas, when he walks into the, to the course to begin the workshop, he sort of says, oh, I have a, a dream that I'll walk in and the room will be empty because you'll all be out there doing it already. You'll, you'll just be out there making films rather than waiting for me. So you get the feel that idea that you, you're articulating something that is essentially instinctive and, and emotional or... It might not be a coincidence, John, that these three fellows, uh, uh, neither of them went to film school. In fact, Abbas, I recall, did go to art school, but kind of half-heartedly, as I recall. He, right. It took him years to graduate because he just was kind of mucking about. McKendrick went to Glasgow Art School for a year or two. Werner didn't go to college at all. So, yeah, you, you've, you've hit on something there. They also, each of them, all three of them, certainly articulated this, two of them, directly to me and in other places and McKendrick it's you cannot but notice this all three have profoundly audience centric approaches to their to cinema to filmmaking and to their teaching it's not it may come out as self-expressive in fact it inevitably always does but from the point of view of how we may learn from them they have profoundly audience centric approaches to things and I very much appreciate that I mean, McKendrick would go on about this endlessly. He happened to teach in a kind of bastion of self-expressive art, CalArts, California Institute of the Arts, where he, he was the founding dean of the film school there. I mean, it's known these days for being the place where all the Pixar animators went, starting in more or less the mid-70s. But certainly for the first few years, it was a place where you kind of went to just be an artist. The notion of... McKendrick stuck out like a sore thumb there because he was always pushing craft on on students. And that was generally not the way things were done at CalArts. So for that reason alone, he's an interesting figure. And I think actually, um, I mean, it took me a while to really kind of get my teeth into this one, but his constant harping on about craft and structure was in part a response to the place where he taught, because there was little of it there. And as I say, he really was um, quite an anomalous figure in that respect. And for my purposes, that makes him a fascinating position from which to look at the entire institute where he taught because he kind of stood on the sidelines looking at the lunacy that's my word not his word but the kind of lunacy of of what was going on around him there's an interesting story about about that art school and his place within it so i'm working on it it's uh it's really um very very uh enjoyable and this material just keeps on coming to light like i say just got a box of material all about films that were never made I mean, ironically enough, there's not... I was just looking at Penelope Houston's BFI monograph on Went the Day Well, the Ealing film, and she, as I recall... Yes, she, she, such a good film. Such a great film, and it's a great book. She's excellent. And she mentions in passing that there's a real dearth of Ealing paperwork. You know, The Balkan collection has big gaps to it. 
the Michael Balkan collection. He's the guy that ran English Studios. His collection is at the BFI. And there's not a lot of stuff that I can find about McKendrick's films, certainly in that collection, but he himself kept so much material relating to films that were never made. So I'm doing a whole book of... Um, I know there's a kind of cottage industry these days of sort of books and documentaries and radio broadcasts, you know, films that never happened, but there's a whole book of McKendrick films that never happened, which includes some of his extraordinary artwork, right. which he just right. tinkered with. I mean, one of the things he talked about was, given that he had quit teaching and was a, a quit filmmaking and became a teacher, he was able to kind of, in the knowledge that they would never happen, he just kind of tinkered away with certain projects for years, notably his Mary Queen of Scots project, of which there is a huge amount of material, illustrations, letters, documents, multiple scripts, multiple script drafts, you know, so mm. it's really interesting. You know, McKendrick's kind of what I'm focused on at the moment. One of the things that connects what you were saying with McKendrick uh, and back to Abbas Kerstami as well is when I was reading the book and, and as you say, he, he's talking about poetry a lot. And I, I used to have a real allergic reaction to when any, ever someone talked about the poetics of film, I was like, ah, you know. And I, I come from literature, so I, I did my PhD on Shelley, so I, I did loads of poetry. And I think by the end of my PhD, I was thinking, I'm really allergic to this idea of poetry. Poetry has become, as a legacy of the Romantics, not necessarily their fault, but has become this idea of self-expression, this sort of rec recollection of strong emotions in tranquility. And it, it's that's the least interesting thing that poetry can do, really, is just just you know, express how you feel. And when I was reading the book about Kiristami and, and reading what he's, how he's defining poetry as like an essential key to his filmmaking, an essential key to all filmmaking, I just started thinking, okay, okay, maybe I should, maybe this has become a, a prejudice of mine. Maybe I need to shuck this off because it, it really, and I was watching close up and there is a, 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 a shot that actually Werner, mentions in Herzog and Herzog of a paint can or a can of some sort just rolling down the street and the shot just follows it because the guy who's standing there who's kicked it he's watching it that's he's waiting for someone to come out the door and that's the only thing that's happening you know and I just thought wow yes that is that's that's poetry because that's what Christopher Ricks would have called the sort of white space at the end of the line. That's the the the. That's it. That's the Kiristami gap. You know, that's that's yeah. exactly what it is. It's, I mean, this is all fascinating hearing you talk about this, John. You know, I have no great insight into this other than, I mean, it seems to me that the notion of kind of Kiristami's poetry. I'm not sure if there's a difference between poetic cinema and. Kind of poetically inflected cinema. I mean, cinema as poetry, poetic cinema, I don't know if there's a difference, but I mean, Abbas would just talk about, and by, he's by no means the first, surely, but this notion of just giving the audience room, really, giving the audience room to fill themselves. And I think that's really the, the most important way that he equates cinema with poetry. It's that strange mixture of sort of economy and space, you know, the, the economy of you're only going to, you're not going to write a novel, but at the same time, there's this space that that allows, which is sort of paradoxical in a way. Well, I mean, after, so the, it was the final, it turned out to be the last workshop, Kiristami workshop I went on. It was in upstate New York and he did, a t he did another 10 day workshop. They were more or less 10 days, a kind of weekend, week and a weekend. Actually, I, as I recall, he, he, he told me during that workshop that he was very seriously thinking about doing a six-week workshop in America where we where students would make a, a feature film. I mean, wow. to, br briefly, the, the, the structure of those workshops was, as you kind of point out, ideally he wanted us to just be out filming anything at all, just so we could come back later in the day and show us, show people what we'd shot. And there were editing suites in London as the years ticked on. People would just bring in completed films. Um, and he would just sit and comment on them. It was a very kind of low-intensity workshop. But during the last workshop, I met a guy called Iman Tavassili. And Iman was, was he's, a, he's essentially a medical doctor here, I, I, here in New York. And um, I got to talking with him. We'd had lunch every day. And um, I said, you know, I, I forget if I'd been to Iran by that point to visit Abbas or I was about to go. But I said... 
You know, Iman, I read all these books on modern Iran to try to give some context to Kiristami and to really understand, you know, his films and his approach to life and poetry and, you know, because Iman himself could quote, you know, reams of reams of ancient Persian poetry. And I thought, there's something here I've got to get my head around, you know. I, I've got to go to Iran. I can't do this book without going to Iran. I mean, I spent time in Munich with Werner and I went to his home, te- his home village in the, in the Bavarian Alps. You know, I, I, there's a sort of geographical connection I feel you've got to make as well. So, so I said, I have to go to Iran. Anyway, Ab, um, Iman said to me, he said, you're doing it all wrong. He said, this is all wrong. Modern Iran has nothing to do with Abbas Kiristami. Ancient Persian poetry, that's what you've got to do. And we got to talking about that. And by the end of the workshop, Iman and I, who we lived a few, few miles from each other in Manhattan, me downtown, he uptown. He said, let's, he said, I've always wanted to translate some of Abbas's poetry. And by the end of the 10 day workshop, we'd agreed that we would meet, I don't know, a couple of weeks later and start this project, which lasted two or three years. Uh, he had to be at work by eight in the morning. So I would get up at 4.30, get the subway uptown, and we'd sit for a couple hours and we translate poetry. I speak no Farsi, let it be said. He would prepare a very broad translation of these poems, and I would, we'd sit and go through them, sometimes spend half an hour on three-line poem. You know, what exactly is Abbas talking about here? Anyway, we ended up years later with, I think, uh, I mean, if nothing else, and I, I have to take him at his word here, Iman said there were lots of spelling mistakes in the originally published editions of Abbas's poetry in Iran. So we corrected those, and we put out... I can't even remember now, John. There's three volumes of Abbas's original poetry, this kind of haiku-like, aphoristic, imagistic poetry. I mean, each one is kind of an image. And as Abbas says in Lessons with Kiristami, as I recall, you know, if, I, if, I, if there's an image in my head and it's not maybe enough to muster a whole film or I can't find the money or I haven't got the... can't, you know, whatever, I can't drive out to film something... He'll just write it as a poem, you know, create an image on the page. And I, I can't tell you how useful that, that project was to really understand, or not necessarily, I'm not going to say to understand Kiristami, but for me to get that book done. So the two books, In the Shadow of Trees, is the collected poetry, which we did. And then Lessons with Kiristami is the kind of my, um, it's written in Abbas's first person, but it's sort of my documentation of those workshops. And I feel the two work very closely together. So that's, really the only insight I feel I have into this kind of film and poetry. I mean, there was no question that, there's no question that when it comes to Kiristami, the films and the poetry and the art installations and the photography and the painting is all part of one big process. I remember, I, saw, I recall, someone will know the name of it, but at the, I think it was in the V&A in 2005, he had this installation where he'd essentially taken photographs of trees. I don't mean landscapes. I mean sort of close-ups of the trees and printed out kind of one for one and wrapped columns in his photographs of trees. Right. And I, I, I maybe put a soundtrack to it. And it was this little sort of tree installation in the Victoria v and It just is all part of the same project. And when, when, you, when you, in his house in, in uh, Tehran... It's just endless, huge format photographs and paintings. And, and he would sit. <laughs> I remember he would sit. Um, there was always someone with him, just some young, bright, digital kind of person, computer literate person. And he would sit on his sofa. So I think he was working on some kind of version of 24 frames. Uh, but I remember vividly he would sit on the sofa several feet from the computer screen, watching what his his kind of assistant was doing. And he had a very long stick. It must be like four or five feet long. And there was a sort of soft cloth taped to the end of the stick. And he would just sit there and he would li- lift the stick when there was something that needed to be adjusted in the image that was being worked on on the computer screen. And presumably, so he didn't scratch the screen. That's why he taped the cloth to the end of the stick. And he would just kind of point to where on the screen that this assistant needed to he would just lay back and just watch 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 this image take shape and i got the same vibe from him when i sat with him for a considerable period when we went over to a friend of his in tehran who had an enormous printer i don't know the details of this printer but the kind of thing that would take hours to print out 
a, an image of a size of, of, a, of a big size. And Abbas just sat there for hours watching this thing kind of spit out line by line. He was just entranced by this machine. He was a very, wow. he was a very interesting guy, but also he just, you know, he liked, he liked to just drive around, drink, not at the same time, drink wine. I got lots of photos of him. I, and we, I just took a lot of photos, taking a lot of photos. All the photos in Lessons with Kiristami I took at the workshops. Right. And he mentions, he says about uh, loving being in cars. And, you know, obviously some of his films almost take place entirely in cars. So that idea of you driving around Italy with him, it's like it's, it's, you're in his, you're really in his, literally in his wheelhouse. I believe me. I'm, I mean, I consider it to be one of the great privileges of my life. This whole thing, I mean, it needs to be said. I've had much more um, good fortune than I deserve on all this, you know. Drinking beer with with Werner Herzog in Munich, driving around cars with Abbas Kiristami. Peter Whitehead, who I've mentioned, was an extraordinary guy. I mean, I was best man at Peter's last wedding. I think it was his last wedding. I can't even keep track. You know, I just, I don't know why. I just, uh, very drawn to these characters. Amos Vogel. Who you're working on at the moment, I think, or, or you've worked on. There's actually, I mean, it's a good time to talk just briefly about Amos because it's his, his centenary this year and right. um, they're doing a new edition of his book film as a subversive art which is those of you who know it it's nearly 50 years old it's the most extraordinary book and I, I worked on a I basically helped put a reprint together in 2005 but what they've done there's a guy a couple of guys here Jim Colville and Jake Perlin um, in New York they run the film desk which is a relatively new film book publishers they've done some interesting stuff they did um they re they've done a couple of reprints they reprinted for example lillian ross's long form essay about the making of red badge of courage the john houston film she wrote right. a book called picture uh, but they've also done what did they do they did a book a pasolini they did a collection of jean-luc godard and marguerite durard dialogues it's really interesting stuff anyway jim has this is actually a kind of just brief it's not an un, not an interesting story because I knew Amos for years. Werner Herzog told me the first person you get to when you get to New York, look up my friend Amos Vogel, who became a kind of rabbinical grandfathery figure to me. I was v very close to him for many years. Right. Right. He died at the age of I think ninety three a few years ago. Um, but he, um, so I got to know Amos and his wife. As, also very domesticated, uh, his wife Marsha, who was just fantastic, and. Um, his book had been out of print for years. So I just, the chutzpah, you know, I, I wrote a letter to George Weidenfeld of Weidenfeld and Nicholson, who right. published the original book, who also happens, happened to have been Amos' second cousin. They grew up together in Vienna. And I basically said, uh, this book has been out of print for years. Generally, if that happens, the rights revert to the author. Would you be able to certify write me write Amos a letter um to let him know that the rights had uh, have reverted to him and the next day um George sent a letter to Amos which basically said you own the rights Amos signed the rights over to a friend of mine who had a little publishing company and we did a 2005 reprint anyway cut to what is that 16 years later oh so we use the original outline uh, films a random house sent me the original layouts of the book and we just right. used those but Kind of amazingly, and this is really, I think, a, an achievement. Jim Colville here at the film desk in New York has resourced all the 10 by 8 prints, completely typeset the book, corrected all the mistakes, because Amos you know, made a few mistakes along the way, spelling mistakes, a couple of factual mistakes. At one point, one photo has been changed, as I recall. He has a great caption about the Keystone Cops, and there's a photo of what he thought were Keystone Cops. It turns out... It was some 1930s knockoff or something like that. It right, wasn't even the right. Kingston. You know, how is he to know? He's going to these little film festivals for years, Oberhausen, and people are, he's watching these films and he's making notes and maybe someone gives him a press release or a 10 by 8 and he, you know, that's how the book comes together. But nearly 50 years later, we're able to make all these corrections. Anyway, so that's coming out later this year. The New York Film Festival and lots of other venues across the city here. And who knows, maybe uh, around the world will be doing centenary events. Amos is an amazing figure. I mean, he really, if nothing else, he helped me appreciate the notion of film curating. What does it mean to be a film curator? Right. He, he ran a film club in New York for 16 years from the late 40s into the early 60s and then became 
the founding, one of the two founders, along with Richard Rowd of the New York Film Festival. I don't. I couldn't tell you if that if the model of the New York Film Festival was his, which is to say, there aren't three hundred films at the New York Film Festival. You know, there's twenty films, very sure. carefully curated, each with a press conference. It's a very tight ship. The New York Film Festival always has been, but you can look back at the first few years. I mean, it's in, insane, John. You look at the first the films that were playing in the first three four years of the New York Film Festivals. You know, they're Okay, they're all Criterion editions. You know what I mean? They're all kind of class. Right. They're all classics right. now, or made. A very few of them. I mean, I've let's be let's be honest. I know almost nothing about cinema compared to some people, but I I've heard of most of these filmmakers and most of these films, right? Or and and seen and loved them as well. You know, so. so anyway, Amos Vogel is another. Reading about him and thinking about about that sort of role is, I think. Nowadays, the idea of a gatekeeper gets a lot of bad press, and rightly so. You know, a lot of the privilege goes along with it, and it's not it's not equitable, and it's not diverse, and all the rest of it. Having said that, the role of a gatekeeper, the actual sort of like, there are only twenty four hours in a day, there are only seven days a week. I can't watch everything. I need somebody whose taste I can trust to kind of point things out. And then whether I like them or not is up to me. And whether I go and find other stuff is up to me. But that role of someone who is able to sort of funnel some of the the best stuff in my direction is, uh, you know, and, and this is what Amos Vogel very much sounds like. Well, you, you, we know what side you'd be on, John, in the Amos Vogel, Jonas Mikas debate, because the Jonas Mikas who died just, I don't know, a year or two ago. Um, they were the kind of two grand old men of New York, downtown New York independent cinema, and they did not get on. And in broad terms, you've put your finger on why Jonas went his own way. He figured that there shouldn't be a gatekeeper like Amos. Everything should be screened. Everything sh- One should be able to see everything. But you're absolutely right. There are only so many hours in a day. And Amos was quite resolute about deciding on his terms, what should be screened and what should not be screened. So there you go. That was a, yeah. that was a kind of intellectual, and actually not more than an intellectual, it was a very real-world debate between the two men. I never, I met Jonas a few times, but I never knew him. Um, but I, I certainly felt much more comfortable. In, in a way, I, I, I mean, Amos was the kind of underdog, because by the time when... By the time Amos had stepped back from the New York Film Festival and more or less was about to retreat into a teaching career, that was only when Jonas Mikas set up the physical institution anthology film archives in New York City, which is to this day remains one of the most important homes of, let's just call it non-mainstream cinema in the world. So what I'm saying is Amos was kind of the underdog. Certainly by the time I met him around the turn of the millennium, um, he was, I mean... Just going back to, you know, if if I'm anything, I'd like to think I'm a historian insofar as this year, as I say, it's Amos' centenary and people are trying to pay homage to him. I've got so many requests to use the interview footage I shot of him because apparently no one else bothered to do it. So, right. so, so I'm very glad I sat with him for all those hours and filmed that stuff. The film I made about him has been up on Vimeo for a decade. Um, I'd like to... I mean, I just stick everything I do up on Vimeo. Right, right. So it's so it's available. Yeah, I, I don't. I just don't, I don't. I mean, there's no money in any of it, so I, why not just stick it all up? Including, a, I just made a 15-hour documentary, which is all up on Vimeo. You know, I just all the Peter Whitehead stuff I did is up on Vimeo. I don't quite. I mean, anyway, there's no money in any of it, so if people can see it and use it, so much the better. Yeah, I mean, monetizing this sort of stuff is is kind of to some degree missing the point, especially when you're preserving stuff as well. My, my, I, yeah. Sorry, can I just say because I was I was not going to mention this, John, but um, you know, this is a podcast about film books. The F- Faber and Faber did the Herzog and McKendrick books, and Walter's very nice about it. Didn't want to do the Kiristami book. I had at least one offer which I think I could have pushed through with the university press to do the Kiristami book. But I kind of said, you know what? As I, I you know, have a book fetish. I kind of want a bit of a control freak. Let's just do this one myself. So there's a fine line these days between self-publishing and setting up a publishing company. But for all intents and purposes, I set up a publishing company. 
and work with a former student of mine to design the book and it's printed on demand which is a very efficient way of doing things there are some disadvantages to it but um i'll just say one thing because you know we all got to eat i've made more money on the self on the self published if you will kirstami book than all my other books put together times several i mean really yes wow there's just <laughs> i tell my own students i rant and rave about them uh, to them about this you must own your work there's no question in my mind that if the technology had been there 20 years ago i would have said to verna fine let's do this one ourselves i mean in in herzog and her in the in the interview book with verna he talks about essentially setting up his own publishing company in the 70s and publishing his own screenplays there's no question in my mind that i would have told him let's just do this one ourselves we don't need favor we will make if that if 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 it were our goal we would make a lot more money a lot more money and it's about owning your work and i'm te- i'm terrible about selling my work i'm not that interested in getting out in front of my work you want to keep a low profile he sa- sa- says <laughs> says cronin on a podcast yeah <laughs> but this, believe me this is a very niche podcast okay, fine. this is the podcast people come to to keep a low profile <laughs> that's great but um so own your own work as best you can is my is my rather pathetic advice on that i mean if you know if paying the rent is important to you <laughs> then you know i i've had a very good experience with the kirstami books and in fact it's entirely likely that the eight mckendrick books i will do myself you do the same way yeah just complete control over them it's not about the money i just mentioned that as a kind of offshoot to being able to take the photos choose the font you know placement on the page i had the image of that the cover of lessons with kirstami in my head for years you know and i wanted to realize it myself and um the print on demand structure is is pretty good i wouldn't do a i wouldn't do a, an image a fully image based book you know those you know the ta- you know there's no way tashin are going to do their books print on demand that's a whole right. other story but for 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 text based books it works very well if you could um like recommend a book for our listeners what would that be what would be your i'm going to just hit you up again with the uh, film as a subversive art which is also a shameless plug um <laughs> but um the, as i say craft is something i'm really interested in and i i do work with film students a lot so young film students So I'm not going to choose one John I'm sorry but there's a sort of trilogy that I not a trilogy but three books that I think are really excellent and one is David Mamet's on direct no uh, what's it called uh, good on di- not yeah on directing film it's a ser- it's 100 pages it's it's a series of essays individual essays intercut with a edited dialogue of him talking to students as I recall up at Columbia University it's really excellent I mean, when I need to talk to students and explain Eisenstein montage theory to students I just go to Mamet's explanations of these things I think they're the cleanest and clearest that exist so the Mamet book is good Pudovkin's film technique is an amazing book right. you can you can find that online anywhere it there's no question that it's a strong influence on McKendrick you know the notion of the ability to fly about in time and space and tell stories this uniquely cinematic way of telling stories is something that McKendrick was big on and I I'm I'm sure that he was in some way influenced by Pudovkin and then another book that he would recommend which I think is also just fantastic is Carol Rice and Gavin Miller's book on film editing I think it's called The Technique of Film Editing it was first published in the 50s before Carol Rice who I met a few times before he'd even made a film he wrote this extraordinary book which was updated a a few times as i recall but then in i think in the late 60s gavin miller came on and wrote or helped write a, a section about as i recall sort of the um the sort of new wave techniques that had emerged in the previous few years but it's such a good book really i mean it's no coincidence and you you know all this john that you know i mean how many great cinematographers have become film directors not many how many great editors have become film directors more more 
I mean, there's right. this notion that editing is a very useful starting point. I'm actually working with a guy at the moment. I'm not sure if a book will emerge from it, but he's a sound editor. In fact, no, he's a, he's a production sound mixer. He's the guy that stands on the set and records sounds. A guy I teach with called Chris Newman, who's won three Oscars for sound mixing over the years. And just sitting and watching films, the films that he's worked on, including The French Connection, The Godfather, Silence of the Lambs. I mean, it's extraordinary how... If he, what, what, sitting with Chris and having him break down how he did the sound in each shot, how unbelievably useful it is. This guy is amazing, by the way. When I've met Chris, I met Chris because I made a documentary about Medium Cool, Haskell Wexler's film Medium Cool and Chris. Oh, such a good film. That's so good. Endlessly interesting, yeah. Um, yeah. Chris, get this. <laughs> Chris said, um, I don't know if I asked him, you know, but he said, yeah, my life in the early 70s was really weird. We finished The French Connection on Friday and started The Godfather on Monday. And I thought, bloody hell, you know, stick, <laughs> stick with this guy. He's a really smart, interesting guy who started out in documentary filmmaking and had an amazing career working closely with Jonathan Demme and Milos Forman. I don't know if anyone's talked about Sidney Lumet's book, uh, Making Movies. It's been mentioned, but nobody's recommended it yet. But that's well, I'm not. I mean, I'm not going to recommend it. But, okay. But I, I. But Chris worked with Lumet. Chris Newman, this guy, worked with Lumet, and I was on the set of Lumet's last film before the devil knows you're dead. Just watching him work, which again is just an education, you know. So, but anyway, the idea of editing as a kind of foundation for learning the craft of film is really. It's really interesting. But I do, and yeah. one, one other, if I may, John, which is just sure. which is a different genre. I just, I think Richard Schickel, who is a very interesting film critic who died a few years ago, just a brilliant guy. I met him again a few times through Haskell Wexler. His biography of D.W. Griffith is just wow. remarkable, I think. Remarkable. The way that he writes, researches, synthesizes it all together. So, anyway. There we go. That's a, that's a brilliant that's a brilliant selection. Uh, listen, thanks so much, Paul, for talking to me. And uh, I mean, one of, actually, one thing before before we, we we wrap up. And so I'm happy to do more, you know. But whatever you oh, want. Oh, yeah, no, uh, yeah. Well, let's 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 continue because I've got loads more more questions. You, you you tell me. I'm 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 enjoying it. So. Yeah, no, I can, I can. We can definitely go longer. Absolutely, no, no problem at all. Well, what actually we could start off with this this question, which was because I when you were talking about the first time that you got into Faber and you you and you wrote your letter to to Werner, it does feel like you yourself have a sort of Her Herzogian sort of. It's the sort of shortest line between point A and point B approach to i am a fairly direct per i mean my rule of thumb is basically ask what you want they can uh, they can always just say no right i kind of do rush in there's a <laughs> i shouted at my students the other day well it wasn't the other day it was a couple of years ago to be honest but you know sounds better <laughs> when i say the other day you know the door when the door to the classroom is locked and i show up and they're all standing outside and there's a locked door and i think to them i think to myself what why Why are you standing here? Why didn't someone have the forethought to go to the office down the corridor and get the key? You knew there was a classroom. You knew there was a class going to start in here. You knew I was going to show up. And you knew I'm the schmuck who's going to have to go get the key. And I shout at them for this. And I kind of, I remember went into a whole rant about how this door is a metaphor. You know, <laughs> I mean, but I was very serious about it. I mean, no one, look, I don't think I've pissed off that many people along the way. But, um, and I'm still very friendly with, you know, McKendrick's son and Amos Vogel's children and Werner and his wife and Haskell Wex's widow, who I saw uh, last week. So it's just about pushing, pushing on and getting what you want and asking, asking nicely what you want. And um, I'm not going to come out with follow your bliss, John, but, you know, I'm just, just very lucky. It's just very lucky to be at the right place at the right time. You know, because more or less the same week that I started at Faber, I, I contacted Haskell Wexler and said, I'm really intrigued by your film Medium Cool. Mm. A few months later, I was living in his house in California, just hanging out with Haskell, driving around with Haskell, going to meet Conrad Hall for the day, you know, the cinematographer. Just these extraordinary, weird experiences. Wonderful experiences. 
What what intrigued you about that film? What I mean, I had no idea. I I just didn't understand it, John. I just didn't understand what it was. Is this a documentary? Is this a fiction film? I was very young when I saw it. I actually remember it was on I think late night Channel Four when I was in Manchester. So it's got to be you know early nineties. I had also my, my I grew up with an American mother in London. So I, right. there was a lot of and she was somewhat of a sort of radical of that period. Bit bit older, but um. Just grew up with a lot of literature. She was a teacher, so I grew up with a lot of literature, you know, those kinds of books, you know, about the, the, the period of the protest movement in the 60s. So it was it kind of always been there for me, and I was just intrigued by this broad synthesis of cinema and history that Haskell had achieved with that film. And as I say, more or less the same time I started working with Werner, I started working with Haskell and ended up making a documentary about Medium Cool that is three hours, three, that is three times as long as Medium Cool. I mean, when, when that, when that um, Aaron Sorkin film, The Trial of the Chicago 7 came out, was that last year? Yeah, it was all, like a year and a half ago. I got all these emails from friends saying, oh yeah, we, we remember you talking about this 20 years ago. I mean, I, I, for, that, for my documentary, I interviewed several of those guys. And got to know Tom Hayden a bit because I also made a documentary and wrote a book, did a book about the student protest at Columbia University in New York in 1968, and Tom Hayden was there. So I got to know Tom, and I saw Tom a few months before he died in Los Angeles. So anyway, yeah, just Wexler, fast, another absolute sweetheart. I mean, really just a very interesting guy. So I, I've sort of got 20 years of notes about Medium Cool, including all these draft scripts that he wrote for the film, which I don't think anyone's really ever looked at. So I'm sort of preparing a book on that at some point. Right. I'm not sure when I'm going to find the time. But Earlier you mentioned sort of in terms of the, the present day, the people, the, the next sort of generation of filmmakers who are coming up and, you know, all, all these schools that, and, and people who have been inspired by Werner Herzog's work, Alice Kuristami's work, Alexander McKendrick, every, all of these people. Is there anyone you look at in the, in the who are making their first, second, third film now who you sort of see and think, ah, that's, that's somebody I want to go and go and have a talk to? Write a, write a letter to. No, well, the best answer I can give you, John, is that a, a good friend of mine, Michael Chaikin, who just stepped stepped down from the most extraordinary job. He's the founding archivist at the Bob Dylan Center in Tulsa. I mean, he introduced me to the Safdie brothers. I don't know, t- not twenty years ago, but not far off. And he, Michael, works closely with the Safdies. And I, I said to him, "You've really, <laughs> you should start interviewing them now." And I mean, I've always, the, the notion of a kind of longitudinal interview book seems to me interesting. Not a collection, a kind of post hoc, posthumous collection. I, I've done three of the, I, I kind of, it was my sort of entry point into all this, actually. I mean, I haven't mentioned, but I did these, I, there's this University of Mississippi series, the interview collections, and I ended up doing three of them. One, one co-edited with this guy, Michael Chaikin. We did one on Arthur Penn, which was also just, wild because at that point arthur was just sitting up in his apartment in on the upper west side in new york and we would just go and hang out with arthur all day he was in good enough shape to direct but no one would give him a job so we just sat and chatted but i so but i've told michael i said you've got to start interviewing the safties who he's very tight with them get in there now and you know in 20 years time after they've made four five six seven more films whatever it is you'll have this book you know, I'm not going to do another interview book with anyone. I'm, I am got my work cut out with um, McKendrick and the Medium Cool book and some other films I'm making. Just very sort of plain interview based films. But um, br- more broadly, if I were to teach a class on, say, modern American cinema, I would just go for I was I've sort of plotted out the syllabus. Paul Thomas Anderson, Jeff Gray. No, oh, what's his name? Is it Jeff? No, uh, Jeff Nichols and um, what's the other guy? <laughs> Hold on. Wait a minute. The guy, G- Gray. James Gray. James Gray? James Gray. James yeah. Gray, who um, did The Immigrant and... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, so Paul Thomas Anderson, Jeff Nichols and James Gray. I think every one of their films is really very interesting. So, But I have to tell you, John, I don't, I don't go to... I don't really know what's going on. Much more fun than going to a film festival, for me, is to bury myself in in an archive and open and just start opening boxes 
Right. It's just the most right. exciting thing because you never know what you're going to find. And you never know, you never know what connections you're going to be able to make. I mean, yeah. when it comes to McKendrick, I, the framework is there. At the moment, it's just trying to connect this to this. And then suddenly, ah, oh, this piece of paper shows up. Or this whole box of material shows up. I mean, it happened. In, 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 I've got letters from McKendrick uh, f to his wife talking about how he's working on a film script with a guy called Kenneth Miller, who wrote crime novels under the name of Ross MacDonald. Oh, and of course, yeah. He wrote uh, Harper. Exactly, right. And those sorts. So he worked, um, he spent time in Santa Barbara with Ken, Ken Miller working on a film script. And I could never work out what film script it was. So just last week, I went off to L.A. because um, McKendrick's son was clearing out a storage unit, and I came back with this box, and wow, now I know what script they were working on. <laughs> they were working on a script to be shot in Hong Kong in the mid-1960s. It was, a, strange enough, it was a remake of a... Not a remake, sorry. It was, a, it was a, to be a rewrite of a script originally written by Francis Coppola called The Fifth Coin. I mean... I've got notes and letters and script drafts and synopses. It's a fascinating little story, um, which wow. I'm sort of writing up, because McKendrick really loved the idea of making a film in Hong Kong and loved the idea of bringing in elements of the politics of the place, the, 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 um, the social life, if you will, the nightclubs, the triad, the crime, this kind of thing. He also kind of wanted to make a slightly sort of jokey... I mean, I'm not going to say James Bond-esque film, but there's a, definitely an element to that, certainly in Coppola's script. But what's so interesting is that he loved everything about Coppola's script apart from the story. He just found the story to be not interesting. And so right. basically he started bringing in a series of writers to, to broadly work with the same characters in Coppola's script and the same kind of tone and style... But, com but to come up with a completely new story. And he went through several and eventually ended up with Ken Miller. And I've got a copy of Ken Miller's treatment here, which I haven't yet read. And McKendrick said the film ultimately didn't happen, but not because Ken Miller's script wasn't, or treatment wasn't good. So I'm, I'm wondering if Ken Miller somehow managed to capture the tone that McKendrick liked and came up with a story. I mean, for me, this is especially interesting because those of anyone that's read McKendrick's book on filmmaking, we'll know that the guy is just consumed in the best possible way with the notion of story. What is a story? What is not? Right. A, what what is a story? What is not a story? And the notion of you know a situation with a half-hearted ending is not a story. Anyone can come up with a situation. Anyone can find an interesting environment and populate it with interesting characters. But what do they actually do to each other, such that the audience will be interested for ninety minutes? Oh man, that's that's speaking to my worst nightmares as a scriptwriter because I have, I I'm struggling at the moment on a script that is brilliant, <laughs> like all my work is brilliant, but it is exactly what you've just said. It's a really interesting situation, and I keep rewriting the characters and making them more interesting and more, you know, less like types and more like you know idiosyncratic and all the rest of it. But in the end, I haven't got a story to tell. There isn't a, there's not a... Well, yeah, John, fair, fair play to you for acknowledging that on this. Yeah. I mean, because I, you know, this notion of, I mean, you know, so if McKendrick, he talks about this in his notes to students. I mean, this is the riches of these memos I've got from his teaching years, the, the fragments of notes of student handouts. I mean, he said outright, if you, if you don't have time to make your, the whole film. He said this to students. Or you don't have the finances or the resources. And if I don't have the time to read the, your whole script, what would he read? The ending. Not the beginning. He'd read the ending. He said, if, if, I, if I read the ending and I get a sense that you have somehow pulled together all these presumably many and varied threads of this, what is we hope, a story, then I know that you've actually got something here. So... You, you know, you, the the problems you're experiencing, John, you know, <laughs> those are the problems, you know. McKendrick did this for 20 years. There's nothing, there is nothing he hadn't heard a thousand times before. I can't, I read student scripts weekly and the same problems emerge. You know, they start, it's like a, it's like a thoroughbred racehorse, you know. Oh, I've got first 10 pages of my script. I say, I'm not interested. 
do me a seven page treatment with a beginning, mm. middle and end, then maybe I'll read it. It's very difficult to get treatments out of students. They want to dive in because they basically want to describe the shots and they want to write their Tarantino-esque dialogue, which is never as good as Tarantino, which isn't wildly exciting to begin with. <laughs> well, it was to begin with. To begin with, it was exciting. I did, as I say, to go back to my Manchester days, I sat, sat on the front row of the corner house as Tarantino as excited as we probably were to watch Reservoir Dogs, you know, it was something. Mm. It was something, you know. That was a. I do and I did. I did love that film when it came out. It made an impact. Anyway, so McKendrick is. Um, he's just. He never stops giving. I'll just randomly open up a, a handout that he wrote to students, and I'll just learn something new. So that's a whole other book that I'm working on. Just editing that material together because there's a, a lot of it at this point is handwritten stuff and fragments that I'm piecing together, you know. But, you know, for example, he sort of, there's a handout where all he did, John, was write a brief summary of the plot of Hamlet, but left off the fact that Hamlet witnesses, Hamlet encounters the ghost of his father at the beginning. Essentially, he he sucks out of the story all dramatic irony. And what are you left with? Not much. You know, what are you actually waiting for in Hamlet? What you're waiting for is implanted in the first scene, which is spacey Hamlet... To, to to take revenge, basically. You know, so these very simple tricks that he did in class. I can't tell you everything I know about storytelling and dramatic construction comes from Sandy McKendrick. He's right. absolutely brilliant. Right. I'm very very privileged to be able to work on that material. And the oh, and the scripts, his own scripts, by the way. I mean, they're they're flawed, but but his commentary on the scripts is is very interesting. You know, explaining what he's doing and why he's doing it, and what's wrong and what's right. You know, he's a re he's a born teacher. This guy, we're very lucky. In a way, we're very lucky that his career collapsed. I be I believe he has a claim to being the greatest teacher of narrative cinema who ever lived. And that and the book on filmmaking is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, it's so good that he, that he's got you to to sort of help sort of maintain his legacy and uh, and bring a lot of this stuff to light. Even though you know, obviously, he was doing that just in his day to day work teaching i'm the lucky one i'm the lucky one yeah. i mean yeah. uh, he, he 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 tinkered with putting a book out before he died but it never happened so i worked closely with his widow for for a while i remember going to that i was i was in the middle of the herzog book in fact that ironically enough the mckendrick book is the only book that i didn't kind of initiate myself every other every one of my other projects i initiated but walter to go back to where we started Sure. Uh, I, I don't know. In the middle of, bef I seem to recall before I'd even given him a, the manuscript of the Herzog interview book, he said, "Have you ever heard of Alexander McKendrick?" I said, "Well, of course. You know, he made those great films." Turns out that no one, you know, in Europe or Britain, really knew he had been a teacher. You go out to L.A., you throw a stone, you're going to hit a former student of his. And I went out to L.A. to his widow's big house in Westwood, and I remember she just opened this garage, and it was floor to ceiling of boxes it's like my idea of heaven john just boxes of <laughs> boxes of paperwork and i just started going through it i spent weeks in the house going through it sorting stuff out shipping stuff back to london it was just strewn about my flat in london for weeks months just these paperwork in piles around the living room just trying to work out what have we got here i remember i also remember thinking no way walter the world does not need another book on screenwriting Right. But he, he paid my way out there, and I said, well, fine, I'll go out there. And then I started reading the stuff in this garage and thought, wow, wow, this is, this is readable and, and useful. That's all Sandy wanted to do. He just wanted to be useful to his students. That idea as well, uh, you know, the world doesn't need another screenwriting book because they're so, they're so popular, those I mean, I'm ashamed to say I've read several of them myself. And it, it's just, I feel my soul shriveling to the size of a raisin every time I read them. And they might be very good. And actually, that's even worse. Even worse if, if they're good. And I feel myself going, oh, yeah, OK, I should do that more. Or I should, oh, I see that trap. And I just feel that something ineffable is being lost in the process. Well, I mean, that's certainly a point of view. All I can say is that McKendrick was not terribly... His methodology is a kind of fairly relaxed one. He doesn't talk about the three-act structure. You know, he certainly doesn't talk about on page 30, this has to happen on page 60. 
it's um he just steps back and and of course he brings with him decades of filmmaking experience himself, which most of these people who write these screenwriting books presumably do not. Um, so, he, but he basically says, "Look, this is more or less how I did it. You know, just it's it's worth you bearing, just paying attention for the next three hundred pages in on filmmaking. You know, you may learn something, you may not. I mean, at the risk of shamelessly plugging here, but dramaticconstruction.com is my website where I've just put right. a lot of stuff relating to McKendrick and other people like Mamet." David Mamet, Aristotle, John Howard Lawson, William Archer. I've, I feel I've read enough of these books to know that there isn't actually that much to say on the subject. And everyone just is really recapitulating Aristotle. So you can, on that website, dramaticconstruction.com, there's focus on five or six individuals. You can discount, if you just choose any three of them, you're going to get the, the nuggets. I mean, right. you could you could just just do Aristotle and McKendrick, or William Archer and David Mamet. I mean, it's all the same stuff. Something else, just briefly, <laughs> you know, because I, I was watching a TED talk with I think it was was it Andrew Stanton, you know, one of the Pixar guys, and he 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 quoted William Archer, who was a an old friend of George Bernard Shaw, wrote a book in 1912 called Playmaking, which is a really right. really serviceable study of dramatic construction. He quotes William Archer, who actually is quoting someone else in his book, but that's an aside. The best definition of drama, right? Expectation mingled with uncertainty. It's absolutely brilliant. You un once yeah. you unpack that, you really get to the heart of things. John, there's no way that he, that Andrew Stanton... In fact, I talked to Pete Doctor and Brad Bird, and they both said that they've since read McKendrick's book, and they love it. But I'm almost I'm I'm convinced that Andrew Stanton got that line from McKendrick. Whether he got a handout when he was at CalArts forty years ago or whenever it was, or he read his book. But the point is this: you know, I talked to a guy who has directed more episodes of The Simpsons than anyone, Mark Kirkland. Right. He's a brilliant guy. He studied with uh, McKendrick. He said everything he knew about storytelling, knows about storytelling, comes from Stanley McKendrick. McKendrick, you know, it's it's one thing to say that. His influence is strong in, in many different directions. But at the same time, all he ever did was just restate Aristotle. Right. I mean, for years, I did a three-day workshop at the London Film School based on McKendrick. So, you know, <laughs> sadly, I can talk long and hard about this for hours. But the bottom line is that it's a, McKendrick is a great starting point to understanding all this stuff, I think. Well, I'm gonna. I'm definitely gonna plug into that because, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, the book, as I said, the books I've read were much more towards that. On page thirty-six, this has already had to happen, or at the halfway point, there has to be a crisis. Or... Not, not the best way. So can I just sort? So, just briefly, again, I know I keep on saying briefly, but because I'm, I've, I've loved, I loved this stuff. But the best use of any of that, any of that literature, John, any of those books, is as a toolbox. You've basically got to kind of do what they call, as I understand it, the kind of the vomit draft, right? You've just got to write this script. You've got to write the script. You've got to kind of be fully self-expressive and write the script out or the treatment. And you will inevitably see some problems with it or someone else will see some problems with it. That's when you apply the fixes and McKendrick will offer you up the fixes. There's a chapter in his book called Slogans for a Screenwriter's Wall, which is basically after 20 years of doing that teaching, as I said, there wasn't a problem with a student script or film that he hadn't encountered a thousand times before. And he boiled his lessons down to a series of little kind of aphorisms and wrote them up on cards and put them on the wall. In fact, the originals are right there. Oh, um, wow. Um, those are the originals on my wall in my study here. Those are the actual original cards that I have framed. <laughs> Um, but the point is that it's a toolbox. The theory is that as, as a toolbox. No one's expecting you to put up on a, in front of your desk before you start writing a script. You know, dramatic irony, tick. Protagonist, tick. Antagonist, tick. No, just write it out. You intu intuitively understand all this stuff anyway. And then when there are problems with it, that's when we bring in Sandy McKendrick. And I guarantee you, because I've done this endlessly in class, and I have, I've never written a screenplay. But I do understand McKendrick, and I do understand his approach, and I do have a lot of his ideas rattling around my head. And I can read a student's script, 
and I can say, you know what, this thing that happens on, let's say it's a 10-page script, this thing that happens on page eight, you really need to lay a fuse for that on page two. It'll pay off much more effectively for the audience. And this character here, why is that character there? And last time I said that to a student, actually, it's interesting. They said, oh, that's interesting you mentioned that. We had four drafts of the script and only wrote that character in in the fifth draft. And I said, well, it shows, you know. This character right, does right. nothing. This character does nothing. You do not need this character. Whatever that character may bring, whatever narrative beat that character may bring to the table, have another character um, essentially um, further that beat for the audience, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, McKendrick's a great... Um, He's, an, he's a, for me, a gift that never stops giving. You know? Yeah, no, I can see that. And I can see, I mean, it's great that you have this trilogy of filmmakers who in many ways are extremely different, come from totally different places, have had very different careers. And yet there are these, and, and as you said, with the three Ps of perseverance, of poetry, and the precision, they're offering you different things, but there's something, there is there is something sort of non-contradictory about it, if you know what I mean. There is something you get you get a kind of holistic view of the of storytelling and and, and the world of cinema. And on, and dare I say, <laughs> of life too. <laughs> I mean, no, can I seriously? This notion of an audience centric. McKendrick wrote a whole series of handouts about essentially look. You have to look at things from the point of view of the audience. I'll look at students. I'll look, I'll read student scripts, John. And these students will be working on these scripts for days, weeks, sometimes months. Everything is completely clear to them. This is all very obvious to them. But is it to us who are reading this for the first time? Hell no. It's a complete mess. They don't look at it from our eyes. And this notion of basically looking at things from the audience's point of view, putting yourself in someone else's shoes is, dare I say, not just a valuable lesson for screenwriting, but for life too. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, that was one other like you, you know you gave me the three Ps. I would I would also offer back back to you uh, an E as well in the sense that thank you very uh, much. No, no, we're not going to go back to Manchester. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, I remember those days. <laughs> well, Liverpool, we had cream. No, I, I, I empathetic. I think there's a there's a real empathy, and I think. Uh, just being self-expressive, just looking in your own soul and trying to say your unique vision is is sort of only a one-eyed vision. It's only a one-handed one way of doing stuff. I think you have to, and all these filmmakers that, that, we, that we've talked about today, they all have this really strong sense of empathy that if you're, and, and empathy towards the audience, like, you know, I, we don't want to bore you. We don't want you to, or we want to understand that if we are boring you, we're boring you in a creative way, in a way that's going to be interesting to you in some other, other sense. I would sort of offer that as, a, as a, a fourth sort of unifying field theory. Yes, I, I, I like it. Like I say, the audience-centric approach is uh, very important for the three of them. I mean, Werner always talks about it, as does David Mamet. You know, literally, these, the audience pays my rent. I mean, this leads to certain political extrapolations which Mamet writes about this notion of there should never be any publicly funded art etc cetera, etc cetera. but you know that's another story <laughs> sure sure listen uh, Paul I'm good I hope I haven't given you too much to edit I'm so, or maybe no editing but anyway it's been a lot of fun John thank you so much <laughs> hope you enjoyed that conversation i certainly found it fascinating i learned a lot i learned a lot more than i expected to tell you the truth i thought it was going to be a good episode but it turned out to be an absolute cracker so i hope you enjoyed it as much as i did all that remains is for me to thank ellie atkins for the music ali howard for the art and you all for listening until next week take care